Greetings, Virgin Islanders. I am Lieutenant Governor Trigenzo Roach. COVID-19 continues to be a serious public health threat. Many of us are going about our business as if the disease were a thing of the past. Regular double-digit surges in a number of positive cases tell us otherwise. Too many are disregarding safety protocols, increasing the community spread and putting lives at risk. As a result, there have been required closures in a number of government offices and private businesses. I understand that there is some reluctance regarding the vaccine. I personally took my time and did my research so that I could understand how the vaccine works and why getting it was my best protection. It was the right choice. Please get vaccinated and adhere to the orders set by Governor Albert Bryan Jr and the Department of Health's guidelines regarding mask wearing, social distancing, and proper hygiene protocols. Take your best shot. Get the vaccine. From abandoned vehicle removals to working hand-in-hand -hand with government agencies, the private sector, and everything in between, our Virgin Islands administrators are there for you. Stay up to date about your administrators every week on Administrators Corner. New episodes premiere every Tuesday at noon on the Government House Facebook page and throughout the week on the Government Access Channel. And we want to hear from you. So email your questions to governmenthouse at go.vi.gov and be sure to put Administrators Corner on the subject line. I'm Janelle, a 16-year-old junior at the St. Croix Educational Complex, home of the Mighty Barracudas. I got my second COVID-19 vaccine shot, and I feel great. I'm encouraging my fellow high school scholars who are age 16 and older to join me and get vaccinated. I chose to get vaccinated to protect my family, friends, and of course, myself. I want to have fun this summer and be back in school this fall. I did my part to help end this pandemic, but it takes all of us. I took my best shot against COVID-19, and I encourage you to do the same.
Good day. Welcome to the Government House Weekly Press Briefing and our COVID-19 update for the week of June 14th, 2021. For the benefit of the radio listening audience, I am Government House Communications Director Richard Mota. For those of you viewing us this afternoon, you may notice a change in scenery. We are bringing this week's press briefing and COVID-19 update from the Cabinet Hall in Government House to accommodate Governor Bryan's 2021 Tech Summit, which leads me to the introduction of our guest this afternoon. Joining our weekly press briefing this afternoon is UVI President Dr. David Hall and Microsoft Representative Mr. William Adams, both of whom are here to share more information of the USVI 2021 Tech Summit. Also with me this afternoon is Dr. Esther Ellis on behalf of Health Commissioner Justa Encarnacion to share the latest COVID-19 testing and vaccine statistics, and also where residents can get a free COVID-19 test this week. We have 15 active cases on St. Croix, one on St. John, and 93 on the island of St. Thomas. I would like to extend our most heartfelt condolences on behalf of Governor Bryan to the family and friends of the 105-year-old St. Thomas woman who passed this weekend and mourn the fact that her time with us which was cut short due to the pandemic. Our thoughts are with her family and loved ones during this most tough time. Eight people remain hospitalized at the Roy Lester Schneider Medical Center with an additional one individual hospitalized at the Governor Wang F. Louis Hospital, currently on a ventilator. We pray for their safe and speedy recovery. At this point, we will go to Dr. Ellis for her update. Dr. Ellis. Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor Albert Bryan Jr. and Department of Health Commissioner Justa Encarnacion for the opportunity to speak today about COVID-19. As of June 12, 2021, the Department of Health has conducted a total of 122,362 tests, of which 3,702 individuals have tested positive and 118,660 tests were negative. There are currently 109 active cases in the territory, 93 on St. Croix, one on St. John, and 15, sorry, 15 on St. Croix, 93 on St. Thomas, and one on St. John. 3,565 cases have recovered with 29 fatalities related to COVID-19. The 29th fatality is a 105-year-old female on St. Thomas. Our seven-day percent positivity has risen to 3.09%. This is mostly due to a surge in cases among unvaccinated individuals on St. Thomas. From our hospitals, the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center reports one COVID-19 admission. The Schneider Regional Medical Center reports eight COVID-19 admissions, of which two are critically ill and one is on a ventilator. We have been administering monoclonal antibody treatments to individuals with COVID-19 who meet the criteria. So far, here are our numbers of treatments. 107 monoclonal antibody infusions have been conducted total at RLS. 48 were conducted in the month of May only, and 40 so far have been conducted in June. There have been 15 total monoclonal antibody infusions at JFL. Three out of 122 patients who received monoclonal antibody infusions still required hospitalization. Two of those have recovered and have been discharged, and one remains hospitalized. This medical countermeasure has been a great success at preventing hospitalizations in the territory. It is clear that not enough people are vaccinated in our community, and the effect is evident with our hospital rates and deaths, as well as the number of those that have received monoclonal antibody treatments. We, are still, we still need to remain vigilant. On behalf of the health department, I want to remind you to continue utilizing COVID-19 safety measures. Masks are still mandatory in all businesses and public spaces. This mask policy applies to staff and patrons. Businesses are subject to fines and closure if they do not comply with the no mask, no service policy designed to keep COVID-19 from spreading. This virus spreads through the air during close contact with others. Masks are necessary to avoid COVID-19 spreading throughout the community. 
I urge residents and visitors to be aware that we are still in the middle of a pandemic that has affected the lives of so many. There is currently a COVID-19 surge on St. Thomas with 93 active cases. This surge reinforces the need for vaccination and basic COVID-19 prevention measures, including mask wearing, social distancing, and frequent hand and environmental sanitation to prevent the emergence of additional cases. I'm asking everyone to fact check baseless information from social media platforms with, and instead research, uh, research conducted from legitimate sources should be used. Some legitimate sources include your primary care doctor, VI Department of Health, Government House, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We want to keep people out of our hospitals and bring our COVID-19 numbers down to zero. Anyone 12 and older can get the COVID-19 vaccine by walking into any of our community vaccination centers. To make an appointment, you can call 340-777-8277 or by scheduling yourself online, covid19usvi.com forward slash vaccines. Epidemiology hotline remains open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m for callers to report suspected cases of COVID-19 at 340-712-6299 or 340-776-1519. We are also offering pop-up testing. You can pre-register for pop-up testing online at covid19usvi.com forward slash testing. Here are our upcoming events. St. Thomas at Home Depot, Tuesday, June 15th, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. St. Thomas at Fort Christian parking lot, Thursday, June 17th, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. St. Croix at the Charles Harwood Complex, Tuesday, June 15th, and Thursday, June 17th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We will also be giving free COVID-19 vaccines at Charles Harwood, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Tuesday and Thursday alongside the pop-up testing. St. John, there's testing at the Vipa Gravel Yard, Wednesday, June 16th from 1 to 4 p.m. Thank you to everyone who has made the choice to get vaccinated. So far, 42,463 people have, a, have obtained at least one dose of a vaccine, which means that 53.5% of our eligible population that can get vaccinated has at least one dose. 34,290 individuals are fully vaccinated, or 43.2% of our eligible population. If you are a parent or guardian of a child age 12 and up, please make sure to accompany the child to his or her vaccination visit and bring an ID for both the minor and the parent or guardian. Whether fully vaccinated or not, everyone should follow the Department of Health's recommendations and local travel requirements that can be found at usviupdate.com. For more information on the governor's executive orders, visit vi.gov. To keep up with the latest information, please visit the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Health Facebook page or website www.covid19usvi.com. And for COVID-19 health information alerts, text COVID-19 USVI 2888777. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. We are eagerly pursuing the goal of 50,000 fully vaccinated individuals in the territory by July 1st. Last week, we announced, it, we announced a general incentive drawing of 10 weekly cash prizes of $100,000 each for 10 consecutive weeks starting on July 6. This is part of our efforts to encourage individuals to become inoculated against the COVID-19 virus. Once you are fully vaccinated locally, you will be automatically entered into this weekly drawn. The only condition for winning is proof of residency in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Please note that if the winner of this weekly drawing is under the age of 18, their cash incentive will be held until they turn 18 as per Virgin Islands lottery rules. You still have enough time to become fully vaccinated before the first drawing. 
you can sign up for your vaccination appointment online at covid19usvi.com or at Vitima's website at vitima.vi.gov. Or if you don't have access to the internet, you can sign up um, for the vaccine by calling 340-777-8227. We continue to encourage every eligible member of our community to go out and get vaccinated. That is truly our best shot at beating the virus. The Department of Education is currently finalizing its plans for the 2021-2022 school year. The plan is, as it stands, to go from 100% virtual to 100% in-person, yes. The plan as it stands right now is to go from 100% virtual to 100% in-person. But in order to preserve the health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students, and to ensure that our school year gets off to the right start, we are encouraging them to become fully vaccinated. Vaccinated before the reopening of schools, rather. As an additional incentive, we are running a special drawing on August 9th specifically for school-based personnel. This includes principals, teachers, guidance counselors, cafeteria workers, and school monitors. We will also be including school bus drivers. To be eligible, your regular workstations must be within one of the territory's public, private, or parochial schools. Three prizes will be awarded per district. A first prize of $25,000, a second prize of $10,000, and a third prize of $5,000. Again, this special drawing is only for school-based personnel and will be held on August 9th. The difference between this drawing and a previously announced weekly drawing is that you will have to register for the special drawing so that the Department of Health can validate your eligibility. We will be providing registration details in the upcoming days. As part of this back to school effort, we will, be also, we will also be providing additional incentives for minors to get vaccinated prior to the start of this school year. Stay tuned for those announcements as well. Again, this, is, this, this opportunity for the special drawing is extended to those who have already been vaccinated and all eligible individuals who become fully vaccinated before the drawing date. In other non-COVID related news this afternoon, we continue to, I'm sorry, rather, uh, we are excited to host Microsoft Corporation in the territory uh, this week alongside the University of the Virgin Islands for the 2021 USVI Tech Summit. As you are aware, Governor Bryan has led the charge to digitize the government and improve the efficiency of government services through the use of technology. We are glad that Microsoft and UVI has partnered with the governor in this endeavor and are happy to host this important five-day summit, uh, which will shape the future of technology across the territory and access to technology right here in our U.S. Virgin Islands. I am pleased to have Dr. Hall here with me this afternoon to discuss further this event. Dr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, the University of the Virgin Islands, uh, Governor Bryan and Microsoft are honored to launch uh, this wonderful partnership officially today. Uh, and that partnership was launched officially through the Tech Summit that was just mentioned. Uh, the focus of the Tech Summit is to benefit from the insights, power, and years of experience of the leading technology uh, company in the nation, Microsoft, uh, and to use that resource as a way to improve governmental processes. So for example, throughout the week, we will be hearing from the leaders of various agencies about the challenges that they face and how through technology, uh, those challenges can be addressed. The range of problems will be from antiquated systems, from customer service, to how we can use technology to improve our agricultural production, 
how we can use technology to improve energy challenges that uh, we have. Uh, every major issue that uh, the territory faces will be addressed through the summit. We are not pretending to come up with final answers in just one week, uh, but we do believe that developing a blueprint for how we can use technology to improve the quality of our lives is something that is so important. We would not be here at this important juncture if it wasn't for the collaboration of uh, Microsoft. Uh, we have just been very fortunate to have individuals from Microsoft who are deeply committed to the same vision of improving the quality of life of the Virgin Islands as we are. Uh, William Adams, who is here with me, uh, has been consistent in his dedication to working with the university and working with the territorial government in ways of improving the quality of life. In addition to the summit, which uh, he will talk about uh, in a moment, uh, Microsoft, uh, through Mr. Adams, is partnering with the university around uh, designing and equipping our innovation center, which we will launch uh, later on in the year. Uh, there is also simultaneous to the tech summit, uh, a summer institute that is occurring on both of our campuses so that our students and faculty members are being exposed to the latest ideas around data science and data analytics. And we also hope to partner with Microsoft around the medical school. Uh, so this has been an exciting opportunity for the university. We are very delighted that Governor Bryan has embraced this challenge and is a fundamental uh, part of this partnership. And I look forward to the summit unfolding this week, uh, but I also look forward to working with Mr. Adams and all of the other people who are from Microsoft who are present this week. I think this could be an enormous turning point uh, for the university and more importantly, for the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, we'll take any questions from the media if there are any questions from the media. So let me talk about the, um, what Microsoft is doing here and why we decided to come uh, in the first place. So I was introduced to Dr. Hall uh, some time ago and the question was simply, uh, can Microsoft be a partner in the Virgin Islands can Microsoft bring technology? Um, that was a question, it was as simple as that. And I looked at the Caribbean broadly and thought, well, there's some 40 odd million people in the Caribbean islands across many nations. Um, and USVI represents a nice beachhead for Microsoft because I'm located in the US. The US Virgin Islands is still the US. So it's pretty easy to show up here and just try to start doing something. Um, the fact that the territory has fiber optic connections, uh, which means fast internet for the most part, uh, means that I can bring my laptop here and do my work and it's just like being anywhere else in the United States. So that was the, a starting point. But to go further, there's a, a compassion we have or an, an empathy we have because on my employee badge it says empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And in order to do that, you really need to be engaged with all sorts of people uh, around the planet. Um, I've been engaged with people in India, with people in Africa, and yes, the, the uh, main United States. Um, so the Virgin Island represents to me and to Microsoft an opportunity to engage with a new set of people, uh, a diverse ecosystem, diverse people, diverse cultures. Uh, these are all things that if we're going to empower everyone on the planet, we need all of that. We need all of that diversity in Microsoft so that we can understand how to address the needs of all those people. Um, now one critical thing that's important to understand about our approach to coming into the Virgin Islands is not to come in as your uh, typical 
big capitalist company. We are one of the largest companies in the world, um, but we don't come in with heavy feet, throwing our weight around and just saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, now pay me all this money. Uh, that's not our approach at all. If anything, and I, what I've said from the beginning, is we come in with all humility. You know, I come in and say, I want to be a part of this community. I want to listen. I want to learn what is needed here. I don't just want to show up and say, you need, you need, you need. I mean, that's, that's not who we are. I don't know what your needs are. So I need to listen. So Microsoft, um, in creating this tech summit, it's really so that we can listen. We can listen to the government. We can listen to the local people. Uh, and we can share and say, oh, OK. Uh, technology doesn't solve all problems, but there are some challenges that technology is the right solution. So why don't we bring those solutions, work together, and figure out what Microsoft can do, right? Uh, and from the beginning, we've, we've said we're just going to do. We're not going to plan for the plan for the plan. We're going to just get to work. And as Dr. Hall mentioned, we've already, for the past two months, been working with the university on a few initiatives, one of them being working on this collaboration center where we'll bring certain technologies and uh, techniques to bear so that students have tools that they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. Uh, and similar goes for the, the new medical college that's being uh, built. We will bring in uh, mixed reality technologies where appropriate and just work with the university on how we can make a better, more advanced, um, learning experience so that the uh, students that go through that school aren't just chasing the taillights of other schools around, but they're leapfrogging and getting to a place where other people in other uh, islands say, I want to go there because they have the most advanced uh, learning curriculum and uh, learning tools available compared to anyone in the territory. Uh, so this is how we view our um, coming into the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a starting place. We want to be in community. We want to solve problems that are existent in the community, working with the community, not just showing up and saying, you need all this. Uh, and last, the, the other part of it for us is uh, we're not coming in asking for something to do something. Uh, I don't need a special tax credit before I will activate. We've been working with the university for the last couple months simply because it's the right thing to do. And it's mutually beneficial for both of us. So we're not coming in with the, you know, you give us this, we'll do that. Uh, yes, we're a commercial company. And yes, we will ultimately make money. And, but this is not about a philanthropic engagement. I'm not just showing up and saying, here's your $2, I'm, I'm out of here. We're showing up because we want to be a part of this community and work very well with the university, the government, and the local uh, businesses. Thank you, Dr. Hall, and thank, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Hall, and thank you, Mr. Adams, for your presentation. Um, we will take any questions from the media, if there are any. Uh, we have Lesiba Knight from the St. Croix Avis. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Lesiba. You may uh, proceed with your question, sir. So good afternoon. Um, Mr. Williams, my first question is for you. Um, you said that working with UVI is the right thing to do, and that's kind of what is the genesis of Microsoft's, Microsoft's um, entry into the territory. What, what is Microsoft's vision in the territory? Are you planning to open offices, um, move or hire um, personnel here, move personnel into the territory? Um, do, do you, is there any plan like that in the works? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the plans based on um, work that I've done previously. For example, I helped us, uh, Microsoft, get into Africa. We went into Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, and at this time, we have offices in both places, engineering offices, which is very important because we have sales offices in many places already. So we're looking at creating engineering offices similar to the way we looked at Kenya and Nigeria. Um, that starts with doing a pilot of some sort, right? You don't just show up on day one and say, we're going to open an office, 500 people, and bam. You have to come in and decide, well, 
what are we, um, what are we likely to develop here, which groups are likely to want to come here, and all that. So we're starting, a, we're on the first part of that journey, which is to say, let's establish uh, the talent, let's figure out uh, what kinds of things would be interesting to do here, and then let's go back and see which teams within Microsoft might be interested in being located here. The primary um, methodology, though, is to develop uh, and use talent here, not necessarily to show up and recruit a bunch of people and take them away. That's the critical piece. So yes, we intend to do work here, and we'll over time, over the next few months or, or the next year, figure out what exactly is the best kind of work to be doing here. Awesome. And um, just one more question for you. Um, it, something that seems a little more concrete is um, the the research or the lab that you want to build at UVI, um, I'm a little vague on the details, but it's a technology themed um, center. So I'm wondering, um, maybe Dr. Hall can answer this, is this coming to UVI St. Croix or St. Thomas? And what, you know, it's early days yet, but what is the vision there? Thank you for that question. Um, the innovation center uh, is uh, a facility that we're in the process of developing. Uh, in St. Thomas, it is going to be in the old West Bay supermarket, uh, which we, the university has acquired. Our goal is to turn that supermarket into an innovation center, or some people refer to it as a collaborative maker space, where students can get firsthand experience using technology uh, to make things. It could be in the area of electronics, it could be using a 3D printer, it could be video and audio production. Uh, but it will be a collaborative space where students in particular, working with businesses and our researchers, will be able to use their imagination to create things. Some things that don't already exist, but other things just being able to do something that somebody else has already done. The, and this was an idea that we were working on uh, long before the partnership with Microsoft was developed. What has really taken that to another level is that because of the enormous experience that they have in innovation centers within the company, because that's how they innovate, mm -hmm. uh, and through working with other community-based centers, they've been able to give us a lot of uh, guidance around the type of equipment that we should place in the center, uh, and the type of projects that students can begin to work on so they can bring their creativity to technology. We do hope that we'll be able to identify a similar type of space on our St. Thomas, uh, St. Croix campus or to build uh, a space on our St. Croix campus so that we are doing it in both places. But we're starting out uh, in the West Bay supermarket uh, as the launching pad for this type of product. Awesome, thank you both so much. I, I just have um, a few quick questions for Dr. Ellis. So, um, Dr. Ellis, uh, the surge on St. Thomas is, it's very worrying. It's, um, the hospitaliz hospitalization rate is, I think, the highest that we've had since the start of the pandemic. I'm wondering, um, since the beginning of the surge, uh, about three weeks ago, there has been a lot of talk about it being centered amongst St. Thomas's unvaccinated population. And I'm wondering if there's any other, um, you know, through contact tracing, if there's any other trends that have been identified. Is it located or spreading through a, spe a specific service sector, maybe, or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And in the beginning, um, it, it really, the trends were really similar to what we have seen throughout this entire outbreak, where the first couple of cases may be a traveler that trickled in, 
because um, your, your tests that you get is a couple of days before you travel, so there's always a chance that someone coming in could still um, be positive when they travel here. And then um, we have a service industry, which is um, any kind of hotel workers, restaurants, bars, because they have come into contact, or those that come into contact with a lot of people every day. Um, and then once we have, the, it then moves to close contact, so our highest um, case number is, is followed by close contact, so household members. Um, we have had um, challenges um, lately on St. Thomas, um, close contacts, quarantining away from family members. Um, so that has contributed to some additional close contacts. And then once we have community spread, which is what we have now, it's um, really too late for us to tell where people are getting it from. There's a lot of community spread on St. Thomas. But again, um, we do have some government agencies that are affected, like what we've seen in the past. We have accommodations and food services, students and minors, so those that can't get vaccinated, a lot of them are under 12. Um, and so really encouraging those that are eligible, 12 and up, if you haven't gotten vaccinated, to get vaccinated, because it really does protect those that cannot. So our, our children, the young children, and some individuals that just can't get vaccinated for other health reasons. And, and do we know how many out of that, um, you know, it's been fluctuating uh, from like 90 to 100, how many of those recent cases on St. Thomas have been unvaccinated? Like a percentage? Yeah, the majority have. Um, there's a couple, um, we call them breakthrough cases that may um, test positive but they, and they've been vaccinated. However, they're not true breakthrough cases because they're not um, hospitalized or have severe symptoms. So really the purpose of the vaccine is to prevent hospitalizations um, and it also prevents you from getting COVID most of the time, but there are a few um, vaccinated individuals that are positive. And then my final two questions, I'm just wondering how the hospital on St. Thomas is coping with the increased number of COVID-19 patients and then also, um, I'll get back to the last okay. one. Well, there's eight hospitalized individuals on, on uh, St. Thomas right now. That's less than we've had at our max. Um, during our, our peak outbreak time, we had, um, I think, almost 20 at one point, And I would need to check with Dr. Amaro, um, the CEO of Schneider Regional, Regional Medical Center, to confirm that as well. Um, but, you know, eight is not good, and really it's preventable at this point. So please get vaccinated if you haven't. And then um, my final question was, a number of weeks ago, uh, the Department of Health had sent away test samples to be tested to see if they mm -hmm. were um, any of the new variants that have been floating around. H have we gotten word on those test samples that were sent away? So far, all of the samples that we have sent are not a new variant. However, we have about 50 pending results and we're expecting to get those by tomorrow or Wednesday at the latest. And so if we do see an, a variant, we'll send out a press release and information to the public to make sure everybody knows what is circulating within our community. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. We have one reporter who is joining us remotely, uh, Suzanne Carlson from the Virgin Islands Daily News. Suzanne, go ahead with your question. Go can ahead, Suzanne. Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. confidence that those figures represent the number of residents who have been vaccinated, or is that likely an underestimate? Can you repeat that question one more time, Suzanne? Sorry. There's no requirement for proof of residency to get vaccinated. So why do we keep referring to the numbers of people who have been vaccinated in the territory as the number of residents who have been vaccinated? Is that accurate? I, do we know I, that I, they're I, I can comment on that. Thank you, Suzanne, for that question. Um, so proof of residency isn't required to receive a vaccine. However, um, we do collect individuals' address when they get vaccinated. Um, if someone doesn't want to provide their address information, that's an option, but most people do. Um, we did find about 6% of those that have been vaccinated within the territory are not 
residents from the information, address information we provide. And um, for those that do win the lottery, you would need to provide proof of residency once um, at that time as well. So if, if you're one of those that didn't give an address when you got vaccinated, that would need to be provided if your name is drawn. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have a breakdown of how many people have been vaccinated on each island? I do, I don't have that data in front of me. I can get it real quick and, and come back or I can reach out to you after this if you want the sure. exact numbers. Um, terms of where breakouts are happening, I have had personal experience with it. It appears some doctor's offices have been closed. Um, I was turned away from a testing facility the other day because too many of the, the employees had COVID. So is there a particular reluctance among medical professionals to get the vaccine? And are we seeing an increase in medical professionals being uh, impacted? Um, yeah, I am. I'm aware of that. Um testing facility and they're um, open back open again. Um, as far as those that have been vaccinated, we don't collect occupation data. Um, so I don't have the exact number of medical providers that have been vaccinated, but we can reach out to the hospitals to get that information. I mean, obviously you're encouraging everyone who's working with COVID, possibly COVID positive people to get vaccinated, right? Right, of course. Okay. Um, in terms of medical, is there a timeline for completion or what, is, is this all hinging on accreditation? Um, the goal is to reach herd immunity, um, which is set at about 70% of our population. So far we're at 53% um, or a little, have had a first shot. So those that have had first shots will shortly within a couple of weeks be fully vaccinated as well. Um, once we reach herd immunity, we should start to see a decrease in our caseload, um, but we're not, we're not there yet. So we do have a, quite a few individuals that are eligible, 12 and up, that have not been vaccinated yet. And so we are providing other opportunities for those to get vaccinated, such as our pop-up um, options. So like for St. Croix tomorrow, we have um, from 10 to noon in front of Charles Harwood in the parking lot, um, pop-up vaccination available as well as COVID testing. And then there's other pop-up opportunities that will be announced as the week goes on. Okay, thank you. I, I apologize for that. I was trying to ask uh, President Hall about the medical school. Is there a timeline for completion of the medical school? There's a timeline of our process for seeking um, application. We plan to apply to LCME uh, this uh, November, and if that first stage goes uh, well, uh, then we would be expecting a site visit next spring. And then the final stage will be in October of next year, where a decision would be made as to whether we obtain preliminary accreditation. And if that goes well, then we would open a year later, which would be uh, in the fall of 2023. So that's the time frame that we are working under. Uh, but as you can tell from my answer, it is not completely under our control. Uh, we hope to present the strongest uh, application uh, and the recent gift from uh, Donald Sussman certainly will help us along with other gifts that uh, we hope will soon come in to have a stronger resource, uh, resourced application than we did before. Uh, but uh, it is really up to the liaison committee uh, for medical education to grant us the preliminary accreditation so we can open. Understood. Uh, and are, are there buildings that have already been constructed for that purpose? I didn't hear. Have, have buildings already been constructed for that purpose? On, I believe on St. Thomas, right? Or uh, Sure. There are two buildings that are, uh, uh, both of them about 80% completed. The simulation center on St. Croix uh, will open approximately in October of this year. The classroom building should be completed by the end of this year. And then out of a grant which we received from the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, there is a third medical uh, facility going up on St. Thomas, which will be the biomedical 
uh, laboratory and the uh, date for its completion is not totally fixed, but we are hoping uh, it will be somewhere around this time uh, next year. Okay, so those buildings haven't been completed and they haven't been used for another purpose? Date. Oh, they're they're not completed yet, um, um, but as I indicated, uh, we anticipate two of them being completed before this year is out. Uh, the simulation center, as soon as it is completed, will be put to the use uh, for which it was built, and that is, we'll start training local physicians, nurses, EMTs, uh, using the latest uh, equipment for simulation uh, learning. Understood. And uh, two, two more quick questions uh, for Microsoft. Does, does the company intend to apply for Economic Development Commission benefits? Uh, I don't believe we've applied for any particular, um, well, anything. So we haven't applied for anything, and we don't have any intentions at this time to apply for anything if it involves economic development. Um, as I said previously, uh, we are not coming to the territory looking for any handouts or grants or tax, or anything like that. Um, so the answer, I suppose, is no at this time. Understood. And uh, the last question, you mentioned fiber optic cable, you know, making it like everywhere else. It's not really like everywhere else. Last night there was a five-hour power outage in the St. Thomas, St. John district, and there's been frequent via outages and, and connecti connectivity issues. Um, do you foresee that being a problem in, in trying to set up, I mean, the, the basic infrastructure is, is lacking. Is that going to impede technology development here? Well, the best we can do is work with the government to improve the uh, infrastructure as much as possible. It doesn't mean that Microsoft just shows up suddenly and installs our own fiber optic cables and all that. There's infrastructure here, there's challenges here because you have hurricanes, you have power outages, all the rest. The system that's in place right now is pretty robust uh, compared to what it could be on other islands you have only satellite connections. So it's more robust than that. It can become more robust. Uh, and Microsoft works in lots of different places around the world where they have similar kinds of issues and we have various ways of doing redundancy for our own systems. Um, we are not going to be here to, um, I don't know, bolster the infrastructure for everybody because that is, in fact, what your own government is engaged in doing. So us being here just gives that for extra emphasis so that the government can say, oh, well, we have another reason to make it even more robust. And that's pretty much it. Understood. Thank, thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Suzanne. We have one more reporter who has joined us remotely. I believe it is Mr. Ernest Gilbert from the Virgin Islands Consortium. Go ahead, Ernest. Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This one is uh, for Dr. Ellis. Uh, you, you spoke of herd immunity and arriving at, a, at about you know 70%, and that would ensure the territory is at herd immunity, which of course allows us to you know operate back to you know in, in a new normal. Uh, the question is, and, and it, it appears that you, you spoke relative to vaccination, but does not herd immunity also include folks who uh, may have been uh, ill prior with COVID but recovered and hence their body produced, um, you know, the immune against the virus? And so I have asked this before. Uh, does the territory um, have an understanding as to how many folks uh, an estimate might have had recovered from the virus with um, and have built up herd immunity, uh, an immune against the virus, to then combine that number with the amount of folks who have been vaccinated to get a true number of what we would call herd immunity instead of relying on, say, 70% vaccination to determine that we have herd immunity? Yeah, I can answer that question. So um, ultimately, it's two completely group, different groups of people because if you have not been vaccinated, you can get COVID multiple times if you've had it before. Um, so if you've had COVID before, please go get vaccinated. The vaccine currently protects against every strain that exists. It's a highly conserved region. 
on the mRNA, uh, the mRNA of the spike protein for the, for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, and then it's a typical adenovirus carrier for the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so far, they protect against all the strains, but if you've had COVID before, it only protects you against the strain that you had. So you could get it multiple times. And so it's a different kind of protection, and therefore we're using the most robust protection, which is the vaccine, to indicate whether our community has herd immunity or not. And it's very clear we have not reached that um, because of the numbers that we're seeing and new cases every day. Okay, so, so of course there, there, there are scientists and physicians who said that the, 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 the herd immunity developed by the, 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 the immune developed by the body uh, withstands, uh, you know, second um, contraction of the virus. I, 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 there, there are multiple um, disputes on that. And, and as you even mentioned, folks who have taken the vaccine, even right here in the territory, have fallen ill. So, I mean, you know, do, do we have a, a solid, do we have solid data as to how the body reacts relative to someone, you know, for someone who's built, built immunity from uh, a previous infection compared to the vaccine? Yes, yes, we do. And the data shows that you are protected against all the strains of COVID that currently exist so far at the protection that's been published. So for some vaccines, it's 98% protected. For some, the Janssen and Janssen, um, the Johnson and Johnson Janssen vaccine is just a little bit lower. So there's always that chance you can still get COVID. It's within, it's within all the use um, authorizations, the data, you can look it up. But the protection is very different if you've been vaccinated versus if you've had COVID in the past. Um, out of those uh, so far, you also have to remember protection is when you're fully vaccinated. So there have been some individuals that got their first vaccine and a few days later get COVID. That's not someone that's fully vaccinated. If, it's, if you've just gotten your first dose, your body hasn't had time to generate antibodies yet to provide protection. So fully vaccinated is two weeks after you've completed the dose series. And um, so far we have not had anyone in the territory hospitalized that has been fully vaccinated. Okay, so I, I was about to ask for a response on that. So you're saying only one person in the territory, though you've had multiple cases of folks who've been vaccinated, probably with a first dose, but only one person who had been fully vaccinated um, have uh, recontracted COVID, has recontracted COVID. We, what I said was we have not um, had anyone in the territory that's fully vaccinated become hospitalized. Okay. Okay, but folks who are fully, fully vaccinated have been diagnosed again with the disease, have contracted the disease. I don't have that exact number on me, but I can definitely look it up and provide it to you par prior to your publication. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I want to ask another one relative to the community spread you mentioned we're seeing right now, especially in St. Thomas where the uh, surge is, on, is ongoing. It, and and it, it seems as it's a persistent surge. It's, it's holding. But you mentioned that that might have started uh, you know, say through travel or the service industry, you got a lot of tourists in St. Thomas. I know we have uh, some stringent protocols in place relative to travel. You know, you got to produce um, a COVID negative test or you, or you can't come here, uh, at least through some airlines. Um, but what about the other parts of entry, right? So how good are we monitoring those spots? So folks who come here um, uh, on their private jets or their or their their um, yacht for example and you know wind up interacting with the community uh which might have led to the current surge right so it probably started in the service or a uh, travel now it is it is community spread how good or, or, or how adequate uh, do you think is the uh, current strategy to guard against other areas or ports of entry where COVID might filter into the territory um, those entering via boat or other mechanisms are also required to fill out the travel portal and show that they've had a negative test within five days of arrival or three days if it's an international destination, and they are required to do that. We have had some outbreaks on ships, um, which have already we've already sent out releases of those in the past. Currently, we don't have any outbreaks on any vessels. Um, however, being on a vessel is in close quarters is a risk. Um, it's a high risk of contracting COVID, and we monitor those very closely. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ernest. And uh, I think we still have one more reporter. Uh, go ahead if you have a question. Joining us remotely. Okay. Not hearing that reporter. That concludes our press briefing and COVID-19 update this week. Remember, please wear your mask, practice social distancing, avoid mass gatherings, and please get the vaccine now that it is available. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Have a good day.